Um, I want to start out with a story today. Um, my parents uh, met in New England and uh, attended a Baptist church together in Boston. Uh, that's where they got saved and, and eventually got married. They moved to Ohio and had three kids. Five eventually, but three at this time of the story. So I'm the third son of three sons. My uh, brother, when he reached five, my oldest brother, so there was Jim, five, Steve, who was four, and Dan, Danny, was three. So uh, my oldest brother got very sick. Um, he was paralyzed, and he was hospitalized. It was a rare disease, and um, it was essentially an uncurable disease at the time. And eventually... Um, doctors came to my father. My brother got s sicker and sicker. And they came to my father at one point and said, say goodbye to your son. Uh, he's not going to make it through the night. Um, sorry, it's hard for me to share the story without uh, being moved by it. Um, that night, my father asked my brother if he would, wanted to receive Christ. So he's getting him ready to go to heaven. And my brother prayed and receive Christ, and he was saved. But what we didn't know at that moment was that he was also healed. <laughs> and so he, he got, uh, every day he got stronger and stronger. Eventually the doctor, let me adjust that a little bit. The doctor said, hey, when you can race me and you can uh, beat me down the hall, you can get out of this place. And so his legs got stronger and stronger. One day he beat the doctor down the hall and he got out. And he lived a very healthy life. Um, he was a naval pilot in his career and he was the captain of the Naval Academy hockey team. Amen. Not only that, he saved my life about five times. So <laughs> if, if he didn't survive, I wouldn't be here anyway. So um, that's kind of, that catapulted my family into a life of faith that my parents didn't just get saved, that they knew that uh, God was a healing God. Amen. And so, uh, you know, when we read the Bible and it's so exciting, we're reading in the gospel or the book of Acts and we see the stuff, you know, the miracles, the healing, devils being cast out, people who are like uh, convulsing or throwing themselves down, getting into a fire, Jesus comes and casts them out. Uh, isn't it, it's so exciting to read about. Uh, what happened with my family after that point was we actually, well, I'll say this, we briefly attended a Pentecostal church. There was a televangelist in our area. It was very popular. And we went there for a little while, but it turned out he was a crook. <laughs> and so we left. And we settled in this beautiful um, church in my hometown, which uh, was a mainline denomination. And uh, it was just beautiful. It was uh, white. It, we had a, a nice organ. We had a choir. We read from the Old Testament and the New Testament every week. Nobody ever raised their hands. I don't know. I think nobody would have. I mean, just nobody even. That just wasn't what we did. And the Holy Spirit, or the, the, the understanding of the Holy Spirit that I was raised with was that the Holy Spirit acts and reveals truth to you and draws you, and then you get saved and you go to heaven. And that was what the Holy Spirit, their understanding, which he does. It's true. I was very loved in that church. So I spent most of, this is a confession here. So I spent most of my life as an evangelical. And I still love, I, there's still part of me that's still evangelical. I, I believe it. I believe that it's true. They have truth. Um, I work with evangelicals. I watch evangelical preachers. Um, Alistair Begg, I, I convinced my parents who were in, in northeastern Ohio to go uh, to Alistair Begg's church, which they attended for years. I love his, his preaching. Um, so I want to say that, but also like kind of as background for what I'm going to get into, I also want to say that after that background, that I started having Holy Spirit experiences about 20 years ago. And at first, since I was in an evangelical church, I didn't really know what to do with it. Um, they weren't bad, but 
eventually we went to a charismatic Pentecostal church, and then there were people that were, could explain it to us. Like, hey, this is what you're experiencing is this. This is a gift of the Holy Spirit. And so we kind of grew faster that way. Um, there's, so there's basically two streams. Most evangelical churches believe that the gifts, the things that are poured out in the Gospels or in the book of Acts or the gifts of the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12 were for a time to establish the church, but then they ceased. And so they're called secessionists. Secessionists. And th so they, they, um, that's their term as well. So they believe that either in the first century or in the third or fourth century that those gifts were no longer needed. And they point to a passage in 1 Corinthians 13 that essentially says, like, love will last forever. Love is going to be in heaven. That is a gift that will last forever. But these other gifts, like tongues, uh, interpreting tongues, healing, um, signs and wonders or miracles, that those things were just for establishing the church. So they interpret 1 Corinthians 13, saying when the perfect one comes, then these things will cease. So they believe that they've already ceased. Um, so there, it's pretty major doctrine to base on pretty, pretty much one passage of Scripture. There's nowhere else in the Bible where, like at the, at the end of Acts, it doesn't say. In fact, the book of Acts kind of doesn't have an ending. It's kind of open-ended. It's like, these things that are happening, we're just going to keep rolling on with. So, um, biblically, just biblically, the interpretation of that passage really is not very strong. Uh, there's problems with, well, I'm not going to get into the Greek here, but uh, neuter, neuter nouns, poor grammar, and a bad context, basically. So, biblically, cessationism is, is not a strong position. Can, so this church, you may have picked up already, you know, <laughs> being here a few minutes, that there's, this is a different kind of church in that the Holy Spirit, um, we believe in that God is everywhere. He's beyond all the universes. And we believe also that the Holy Spirit is dwelling inside of each believer, that we're temples. But that there's also something, the manifest presence of God, which is sometimes God will choose to be in a certain specific location, like the Shekinah glory in the Old Testament. And so this church, together, we try to attract the presence of the Holy Spirit. And some of that can only happen by allowing him to have free reign, to, ha to give him the freedom. <laughs> so if things feel a little bit less organized or whatever, we're trying to give space for the Holy Spirit and to respond to him. So that's what that's about. So since, so this is a group that believes that all those same gifts and the things that were in the book of Acts or in the Gospels, that those things can still happen. So we believe that they can. And actually through church history, if you read the charismatic history of the church, those things were happening throughout the history of the church. I'll say though, not many times to the extent that they were in Acts. And even now... Um, there's a tension here in that we believe that those things can happen, but they don't always happen to the level that we would like them to happen. Or that we're, we're, I'm reading the book and I'm going, Lord, how can we release that here? But throughout the history of the church, like Augustine, uh, one of the church fathers, um, he didn't believe in healing or any, that, that the uh, gifts were still in operation, and that was in his writings. And then later on in his writings, he had had experiences with it, and so he changed his tune. So that's, so that's hap happened throughout the history of the church. Sometimes um, we need to base our beliefs on the Word of God. Yeah. This is a, a church that believes in the Word of God. This is inspired truth. It's inerrant. Yeah. Um, so we don't base our belief just on experience, even though we do see healings, even though we have seen miracles. Many Christians have seen that as well. We don't, believe, we don't base it just on that. So we don't base this just on our experiences. So we don't want to do that, but we also don't want to base our beliefs on a lack of experiences. Like, 
because I've been in a church where this stuff never happened, then that means it can't happen. Or they never teach it that way, or they taught against it. So that, that's kind of like an equally uh, bad way to go, I guess I would say. So uh, with that as kind of a backdrop, I wanted to share what I hope will be a rhema word. And maybe some of you are thinking, what's a rhema word? What does that mean? It's a Greek word. And maybe some of you are saying, like, why are you saying you hope that it is? It either is or it isn't. <laughs> so I want to explain that, too, what I mean by that. So there's two words for, the, for word in the New Testament. So there's logos and rhema. And their, their definitions are very similar. So logos, when we see the, the written ink word on the page, and when we understand it correctly, we correctly divide the word at that point, it becomes logos to us. So like uh, Jesus, when he told the parable of the sower in Luke, at the end of it, he goes with his disciples and he says, you know when I was saying about the sower spreading the seed? He said, the seed is the word of God. And the Greek there is logos. So when the sower spreads the seed, that's logos. Now, an example of when rhema is being used would be in Ephesians 6. So Ephesians 6 talks about the armor of God. So when he talks about the sword of the Spirit, his very word. So that is rhema. So the difference, really, when you look at the difference in how logos and rhema are used, logos is the truth of the word rightly divided and taught, but rhema is a word that you activate and act on. So you don't just know it as head knowledge. You activate it. You step into it and you use it. And so that's why I'm saying I, I hope that I share a rhema word because I'm hoping that we can use it even today. So now I have a confession. Uh, sometimes I need spiritual remediation. Uh, sometimes I need help. Um, this may sound weird to you, but um, I feel like um, over time, God has allowed me to ask him for a word. Uh, I, I believe in studying the Bible line by line using normal traditions of hermeneutics and, and uh, interpretation. I believe in that. But I also believe that sometimes you can ask God to say, hey, speak to me through your word, and he'll lead you to a specific passage. And so there's been about three times in my adult life where I would say, Lord, give me a scripture, and he kept leading me to the same scripture over and over and over again, um, you know, through a period of months. And the, what I discerned after a while is like, I didn't get it. I missed it. Like, you're still missing it. You still need to know this. And so that happened to me with John 11, uh, the story of the death death and resurrection of Lazarus. So I was kept being led by the Holy Spirit to the middle part of that story, the part where Jesus is talking to Martha. And so I kept going, and I kept like, then I, the more I felt like more of an unction on it, like uh, there's something really important here, I, something I really want you to see. And eventually I got an insight, a revelation into what I feel like the Lord was saying. And so wh when I get asked to preach, maybe once or twice a year or whatever, I just pray and I say, Lord, what would you have me share? So I, I'm not, and that's what I got. I got that I was supposed to, what I showed you in John 11 is what I would like you to share with the church. So that's why I'm doing this. So John 11, um, let's talk more about that. So let me set, kind of set the scene. So Jesus is out preaching with the disciples. Um, he gets a message from Mary and Martha, Lazarus' two sisters. So the message is basically, the one that you love is sick. So it's kind of an interesting message because they didn't ask him to come or to heal Lazarus. They just said, hey, the one who is sick the one who you love is sick. So I think that part of it is what you might guess. I don't know if this is true, but maybe it's like 
we're in so tight with Jesus and you love us so much that we know that you'll come. But Jesus purposely stays away. He stays away until Lazarus dies and he says to his disciples that I'm doing this for the glory of God. And then he goes to Bethany, which is only a couple miles from Jerusalem, and he meets with, with Martha first and then Mary, and then they go to the tomb and he raises Lazarus from the dead. He commands Lazarus to rise up and come out of the tomb. But there's this interesting part. So let's go to that, that passage. So picking up in the middle of the story here, uh, uh, verse 17, on his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. That was by design. Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Mary and Martha to comfort them in the loss of the brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God, even now, and that's the title of, of this talk, even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And I'll go on maybe further than the slide. Yes, Lord. She told him, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. So um, I kept getting led back to this over and over again. And, and eventually what, what I got from it was the Holy Spirit was saying, you keep reading this like church history. You're reading this as a narrative story and things that I did for these three special people. But do you know that I'm the same right now? with you even though you can't put eyes on me and the spirit and then immediately I started thinking the, the scripture Jesus is the same yesterday today and forever he hasn't changed he's still a healer he still does miracles and I felt like he was saying to me do you believe that I'm the resurrection and the life Do you believe that I'll still do this? Do you believe that you could ask me? I, I feel like um, I once heard a, a guy who said um, in prayer, he, he confessed that he said to the Lord, Lord, I think those people are trying to take advantage of, me, of you. And what he heard back was, I hope someone will. <laughs> so... <laughs> So I feel like, what I feel is that so, um, there's so much more on the table that the Lord is willing to do that um, we don't always know how to, how to partner or we don't, we, we assume like, oh, it's great. You know, like in this case, Martha's like, hey, I understand Lazarus, is, he's going to be resurrected. He's going to heaven. I get it. And I believe that you're the Messiah, so was she wrong? No, that was exactly right. That's beautiful that she knew that. But she didn't know that in just a few minutes that she was going to see her brother get raised out of the tomb. So I guess I want to say to you, do you all believe that? Since I'm, I feel compelled to share that with you all, do you believe that Jesus could do that for you? So, even now, even now, yeah. So, I feel like that's um, maybe in a Pentecostal sense, you know, rhema, sometimes people will take to mean like a now word, which is like God will say like this scripture I'm doing right now. And I, I believe that. 
I believe that, that that's God's heart. Maybe it's been his heart all along, but I think that he's ready to pour things out. He's hoping people will join and press in. I wanted to uh, share or suggest a way. Again, this is prayer, so I got this in prayer. And I think there's a biblical backing for all this. So um, take it for whatever you will here. But I was praying and I said, Lord, how, how, can, how can I enter into this? And he said, seven things. So the, I'll just list the seven and then I'll try to give you some scriptural backing for it. Number one, to open a box, ask me that if it's my will. So... If there's something you want to ask me for, first determine if it's even my will. Okay? I think that's pretty sound. Ask me for confirmations would be the second thing. The third thing, once you know that it's my will, ask me for it. For four step. If it doesn't manifest immediately, contend for it. The fifth thing, if you get weary, press into me. The sixth thing, when you're with me and you're pressing in, worship and praise me. The seventh thing, when you know my will and you've done these things, my rhema becomes irresistible. My rhema cannot be resisted. So I just had a picture of like at the, at the end of a boxing match when one boxer's taken one too many punches and they start to go around like this, and you could almost like breathe on them and they would fall over. I kind of think the enemy can be like that sometimes. So let me give you a couple of scriptures to back this up. So I'm not trying to propose this as some kind of a formula. Uh, formulas, God doesn't, he's, he's, uh, he doesn't operate under formulas. But I would say it's a way of relating to him. So, um, ask if it's God's will. So, uh, John 5, 19, you know, Jesus himself, when he's uh, giving an answer, says, Very truly, I tell you, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees the Father doing, because whatever the Father does, the Father also does. So, Jesus himself, he wasn't a free spirit, like he was in full alignment. The Holy Trinity, they're always in alignment with each other. So he's not going rogue, doing a bunch of stuff, saying a bunch of stuff that the Father doesn't want him to do. So we shouldn't either. We're Christ followers. So that's not what we should be doing. Um, In the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6, obviously it says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So... um, We should care about God's will. We want to stay out of the flesh. We're commanded not to covet, um, which could lead to witchcraft prayers. So if somebody is stewarding something and we want it, um, I think that we should uh, get extra confirmations that that's something that we should even set our hearts on. We're not supposed to be praying for things out of that kind of a spirit. Um, we want to uh, check our motivations. Jeremiah uh, seventeen nine would suggest that. So um, we can be deceived by ourselves and in other ways. So we should be careful about that. And I guess that's why we would ask for confirmations. So this is a little out of context, but Matthew 18 talks about... Um, establishing everything through other people with witnesses. So in a way, uh, sometimes um, if we're, if Donna and I are talking about like how much should we give, sometimes we will pray and we'll get a number, but we won't tell each other. And then we'll come together and see if we got the same number. So in that sense, it's good if you ask people to pray into things without giving them a leaning one way or the other, then that uh, you might be able to trust the confirmations. But God speaks in a whole bunch of different ways. He definitely speaks through his word, but sometimes he speaks through circumstances and other believers. So 
I've shared before a story of um, after we had our business fail, that uh, we had somebody coming after us, a, fran- a franchisor come after us for money. And I kept having people appear in my office who were trying to sell me prepaid legal services. Like twice in one week, I thought it was the weirdest thing. And then Donna was saying, I think that we're supposed to get a lawyer. And I said, no, no, that's not biblical. You know, no, 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 and all this kind of stuff. Well, eventually there was enough circumstances like that where I was like, okay, I give. Hire a lawyer. And so the lawyer went, contested it, and we were forgiven tens of thousands of dollars. So... God was speaking through those circumstances that he had a way for us. And um, I don't, I said before, I think the franchisor is doing fine, so I'm not worried about that. <laughs> they're, they're doing great, even to this day. Um, once you know that it's my will, ask me. So James 4 and verse 2, it talks about sometimes we don't get because we don't even ask for it. Like, um, the Lord want, he wants to be in a relationship with us. So he wants, wants, to, wants to have us ask. If it doesn't manifest immediately, contend for it. So um, Paul talks about a man who went to the third heaven. It was probably Paul, but we don't know for sure. But so we live in the first heaven area here, in, you know, and there's a third heaven, so... By implication, there's probably a second heaven. And Ephesians 2.2 2 says that, you know, the devil, he's not hanging around in hell. I mean, that's a nice thought for cartoons and stuff like that. But um, he's in the air. And so he and his crew are trying to block the things of the kingdom, trying to block blessings. And so in Scripture, you can even see that that happens. In Daniel 10.13 uh, Daniel prayed, got an immediate yes in the throne room in heaven, but the archangel Michael, it took him 21 days to get to deliver the good news because he was thwarted by the prince of Persia, a demonic power. Elijah in 1 Kings 18, 43 and 44, when he's praying, you know, so he stopped the rain through prayer, and now it's time to start it back. But he didn't just pray one prayer. So he had to pray seven times, and then he had to have his assistant go and, like, see, and he comes back and says, there's a little billow of a cloud, and Elijah's like, good, we're doing it. So um, he contended for it. He kept praying. Jude one twenty three says to pray in the Spirit. Many other scriptures also pray, say to do that. When you get weary, press into me. What's, what's God? Sometimes... Um, when my sons, my sons are amazing. They're both here. I love them. I love you guys. <laughs> Sorry if I'm doing that. Uh, one time I had a full beard, and when I was speaking, the, the thing was rubbing against my beard the whole time. Hopefully I'm not doing that. Um, for me, when they get really busy, my father heart gets hungry. I want to spend time with them. I want to connect and I think sometimes we have to contend and, and lean into God be, just because he's a dad and he, he wants to spend time with us. So he's not going to give us the quick yes if the quick yes means that we're going to immediately be off and, and on our way. So sometimes these things are by design. They're not necessarily demonic in origin. When you're with me, worship and praise me. Psalm 22.3 but you are wholly enthroned in the praises of Israel. So he inhabits our prayers and our praises. So when you know that it's my will, those that get that rhema word. So, you know, I feel like this is kind of some of those uh, great promises in Scripture, like speaking to the mountain, you know, that... Um, those aren't, aren't hyperbole. They're, they're not exaggerations. That miracles can happen when we pray. We've seen them. Like I, I, started, I started with that, talking about my brother. So now, rather than just talk about this, 
I wanted to kind of give an, an opportunity for us to activate that. So sometimes when I'm counseling couples and things like that, um, I might say, hey, let's, let's talk through an issue and see how that goes, but let's not start with your Waterloo. Let's not start with like the worst of the worst repetitive fight that you are broken over. Let's start with something either easier or medium size. So I might suggest that to you um, if you're looking for something that you need breakthrough for, you know, maybe today try to start with something smaller rather than the thing that you've already been praying for for a decade. That's just a suggestion. Um, so actually, Rachel, if, if you could come now. And so I just wanted to give an opportunity for us to pray. So if you all can think of something that you would like to see happen, where you want to step into this. If you, if you believe that John 11, that God is offering this to you, if you do believe that, I thought that it would be great if we could turn it into a rhema word, if we could pick up the sword and we could activate it here and make that word, if we can do that. So I wanted to take a minute, if, if Rachel can just play keys quietly, we're going to pray, and then just like he was saying, then we'll uh, worship and praise after that's done. So let's pray here. So Lord, thank you. Thank you that you are the God of the Bible, that you didn't run out of energy, uh, that you still heal, you still release miracles, you still speak just thankful for that you are the resurrection and the life so we're just going to be quiet here for a minute and give people a chance to speak with you about anything they'd like to ask you for or ask if it's your will
so Lord, thank you for this time to um, step into your word. Thank you for what a great father you are. You're amazing. Thank you for your father heart. Holy Spirit, you lead us into all truth. You comfort us. Your word says you're a counselor. Thank you for being present here today. Jesus, thank you that you never change. So just like you stood in front of Martha, you, you were the same. You're still a healer. You still release miracles. You're a miracle working God. Thank you for how you intercede for us on the throne every day. Thank you that not only did you die on the cross and rise again and ascend on high, but that you're a king and you've made us part of your kingdom. Pray this in your name.